All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you to all of you who are joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, the Abbey Museum, weaving together Indigenous knowledge, expressive culture, and allyship. And thank you to everyone who is watching this recording on YouTube. We are so honored to welcome Betsy Richards today. Betsy is a member of the Cherokee Nation, Executive Director of the Abbey Museum, and Senior Partner with Wabanaki Nations. She brings more than 25 years of experience building cultural and narrative power for Indigenous peoples and BIPOC communities, and is guiding the Abbey's recent transformative tr journeys. Betsy is with us today to discuss the museum's renewed dedication to centering Wabanaki nations, putting indigenous knowledge and values at the forefront, and activating visitors as allies. We'll peek behind the curtain together and learn about the Abbey's new strategic plan and value statement, and we'll also get a sneak peek at the upcoming Dawnland Festival of Arts and Ideas. Thank you all for being with us today. It's going to be a, an incredible program. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to building a just, thriving future for all by acting on the climate crisis, protecting the environment, and safeguarding our democracy. MCV does that by advocating for equitable policies, holding elected officials accountable, and winning elections. MCA does that by bringing people to and organizations together to educate, inspire, and advocate. We've been doing that together in this space since 2020 with a weekly online Lunch and Learn series that helps us advance all of our goals and creates a shared space for us to explore our environmental and social history, our policy priorities, the climate action movement, and more. A few notes before we dive in. We will hear from Betsy first and then tackle your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send questions through the chat to me or to Maggie Summers whenever they occur to you. Maggie and I will keep track of those and synthesize those with, with similar themes and get us all ready to ask as many as possible following the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, Maggie is the one to help you out, so you can send her a message through the chat. This event is being recorded, and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon. You can also find recordings of all of our programs on YouTube, where a number of playlists will help you focus in on particular topics. Thank you all again for joining us, and Betsy, I'll turn it over to you. is here. Let me make sure that you can turn your microphone on. Does that work, Betsy? Yes, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Sorry about that. No worries. So um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Um, once again, my name is Betsy Richards. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you have been to the Abbey Museum before. I, um, I don't know if you want to have a show of hands or any thumbs up, um, but I'll, I'll just take a minute and, um, and share with you a, a little bit about the Abbey. We are a museum, we're almost, uh, we are in downtown Bar Harbor, and we are, also have a location in Acadia National Park. That is our historic location. Uh, we were founded in 1928, and in um, we are uniquely um, a Wabanaki majority governed private museum. So we're not a tribal museum. And uh, we are the only Native American led uh, organization in I think Hancock County. 
and we are situated in the homelands of the Wabanaki people, very dedicated to telling uh, the story, the history, living culture, and futures of Wabanaki people. Um, I want to begin this talk today with the Native value um, that Wabanaki people share, but myself as a Cherokee citizen, it's really, really central um, to us too. Um, and I never want to say something is like a just pan-Indian because it's really important to realize that each tribal nation has its own culture and own history, but we do have some things in common. And I would say that that, that value that I want to share today is interrelatedness. And this value runs through a lot of things. Um, and it, you know, part of the title of this presentation is Weaving Together. Um, and to use the excellence of Wabanaki basketry as a metaphor towards this value of interrelatedness. So, um, you know, seeing the environment not only as something to conquer, but some someone something that's related to us, uh, that the land and waters um, and all of nature is our relative and we care for it, um, Very, which is a very different way of being. Um, and so that that's just a value that I want to point out that's going to run through this presentation. Uh, the Abbey is at a very exciting moment. Um, and I hope to not only just share uh, what we're doing, kind of the activities that we're doing, but really more importantly, why uh, we're going in this direction and, um, and ways that you could either join us or, um, you know, we're talking about allyship because allyship is very much about how do we align? Um, how do we find ways that we can be complementary uh, in, in this space? So I'm delighted to uh, join you today. Next slide, please, Maggie. So the Abbey is coming up on a big anniversary. It's 100th anniversary in 2028. Our original museum name was the Dr. Robert Abbey Museum of Stone Age Antiquities. Uh, we were founded by it, we were founded by a doctor in the early part of the 20th century, um, and the the space that he, what he was collecting was archaeological materials um, from uh, it, he was kind of a you know had a archaeology hobby, but. Obviously, the messaging of what even the museum was named harks back to an earlier time where even though Wabanaki people were present, um, we were seen as something of the past. We were seen as a remnant of a of more of primitivity also. Uh, and things have changed incredibly at the Abbey Museum, going from a place of um, of friendliness, yet completely in a box of pre, pre of, of we're not here anymore, or if we are, there's just this remnant uh, that's that's left, and that we're primitive. Um, uh, I think you'll see that in the last um, that we are carrying on a tradition that from 2015, when the organization decided to go through a decolonization process which was one of the first in the United States of a non-native institution deciding to change its structure, its, its uh, policies and its procedures to center on um, native power. Really, it's, I, I like to keep it nice and simple. Decolonization isn't about going backwards. It's about power sharing. And it's about listening. Um, and you know, one of the easiest ways we talk about it in Indian country is we are a nothing about us without us museum. Uh, so uh, in this hundredth, looking towards this hundredth year, um, we also are we are in the midst of a strategic planning process. So there were like three quarters of the way through. But part of thinking about where the Abbey needs to go in the future um, really has to do with kind of scanning the landscape and really looking at this moment that we are at coming out of the pandemic. 
the racial reckoning that we've had, the climate um, uh, chaos that we've had and kind of calls for changing that, but also at a few other indicators of really what's needed. And I think it's what's very important at this moment is the idea of museums are actually changing. Museums had been, um, as we're looking at this centennial photo, had been very much about um, stuff <laughs> and keeping things in the past. Um, museums had come about as like cabinets of curiosities of people from all over the world looking at the other. Um, and museums can be a place of um, public education, um, of animating a kind of a, a democratic uh, place for public, public conversation, public learning, but also public debate. Uh, and our, our exhibits are very much geared towards having both the scientific side of things, but listening to native people, listening to their traditional knowledge and explanation. Um, so we really hope to, uh, to move the Abbey forward in these ways. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that really came to me as a native person, um, I have had relationship in the past, I was a funder at the Ford Foundation and the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance um, was one of my um, uh, grantees back in the early part of the 2000s. And, the, and um, so I had been up, I had established relationships and was really, really blown away, not only by the artistry of the basket makers, the Wabanaki basket makers, but the advocacy they were doing around um, uh, protecting the, the their gathering rights, protecting the ash tree and, and the um, sweet grass. Um, so they were like environmental activists, um, tribal rights activists, as well as phenomenal artists. And uh, one of the things that really struck me um, in, in taking this position, was the fact that very few people in the United States are aware of the sovereignty challenges um, that um, Wabanaki tribal nations face. And this type of, um, this chart here is about, um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, the overturn of the um, Maine Indian Land Claims Act, that is, you have a group of tribal nations that have their federal recognition, which means the federal government recognizes them as having a direct government to government relationship. Um, and, but there are barriers to that because of legislation that was enacted in the late seventies, early eighties, um, that makes them munip municipalities of Maine. And this chart is very briefly just shows what that legis what the, um, that legislation has done financially uh, to Wabanaki nations in Maine, which means they are really behind. This is showing that they have 9% growth versus tribes that are able to fully exercise their sovereignty. Um, in the last uh, 30 years, I think it is, uh, have, have really been able to grow financially have been able to do amazing economic development. So this is just a piece of reality of really under resourced tribal nations that are doing, but that's not to victimize them because they're doing incredible work, um, but is a, is a piece of, the, of the, what we're looking at. Next slide, please. And then on a national scale, um, I, I had worked on uh, the first uh, public opinion and narrative change research uh, project for Indian country called Reclaiming Native Truth. It was uh, funded by the Kellogg Foundation. It was a major multi-year uh, research project. And what came out of it was some things that we weren't so shocked by but were really important to do methodically and science and you know kind of with social science data. Um, Seventy-two percent of Americans almost never encounter or seek out native information on Native Americans, 
I know Maine is different, but 27 states have no Native Americans in their curriculum, in their school curriculums. 87% of states don't even mention Native Americans past 1900. Um, we're highly underrepresented in the media. And, you know, when searching Native American, 95% of the images that come up are from the 19th century and less than 0.3% of all philanthropic resources goes to Native Americans. These are, these are, these are scientific, like all this research was done with the top firms in the country, um, top research firms in the country. So these aren't just like, oh, we're being so negative about this. Some of the good news about these numbers is that there's also um, on the flip side, I think it's like 72% of Americans also want to learn more. So we're really at this tipping point and we have places like Maine that have done something, maybe not the complete thing they need to do, but have really done something about the curriculum. We are seeing more, a few more TV shows, um, but, but these disparities are still there. Next slide, please. And, you know, part of what I want to give as a background of what a museum can participate in, and this is something that I have a bit of a background in, is really as a public education institution. There is a, a, a space between actually informing people, giving them knowledge, and then actually figuring out ways to break through their mindsets that they're coming with, not blaming them for, you know, many Native American, maybe many Americans have no idea, haven't taught, been taught anything about Native Americans, let alone about specifically Wabanaki people. Um, and for those of you that are interested in the environment and that really care about that, we also know a great example of just giving people information um, you can say that the climate is warming and you can give them facts and figures and facts and figures and people will just put it out of their mind or come up with some other um, some other explanation to themselves, right? It's, it's what's convenient to them. And narrative change, I just put this, um, uh, this definition is here, is an intentional and coordinated effort to replace an existing narrative, which I would call a, do a dominant societal story. So the dominant societal story is we're not around very much um, uh, or, or we're from the past, uh, is that we need to replace it with something new in order to, and, and this is the key point, is not is to shift attitudes, behaviors, practices, and policies um, that can lead to deep deeper and lasting changes in systems and cultures. Um, and, and just a quick, this is a good quote by Abraham Lincoln. Public sentiment is everything. With, a, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And for us, part of what we're, you know, having our visitors come to the Abbey Museum and experience Wabanaki culture, learn more, what we want to do is also get them to the point where they're activated, where they know what to do, um, where maybe the, not only is the story changed in their mind, but we can help shift their, their behaviors and practices too. Next slide. So with that, I, you know, you are, some of the first folks getting to see this, we've gone through a strategic planning process. We did a lot of listening. Um, so we have a new mission statement at the Abbey, and it, it is and to illuminate and advance greater understanding of and support for Wabanaki Nation's heritage, living cultures, and homelands. Um, and embedded in some of that is that we not only want to have greater understanding, uh, but we want to build support. So that's where the activation comes in. And that that support is not just for heritage, but it's for Wabanaki futures and for the land to really understand not only this is their homeland, but how to care for it. Um, and our vision statement of where we want to get, and this is really 
related to what I hear you guys are working on, right, at um, MCV, is we want a profound shift in understanding, respect, and support for Wabanaki nations that leads us all into a more thriving and equitable future. Um, and so we're doing this not just to serve Wabanaki nations. The kind of theory of change that we have is when Wabanaki nations thrive, we are all able to thrive. Um, when our environment thrives, we're all able to thrive. Like this is a this is a message for everybody, not just a a, a guilt trip for Wabanaki people or um, just one way advocacy. We really truly believe everybody belongs in the circle. Um, this gets back to this value of interrelatedness and how we're weaving this story. Next slide, please. Um, and I'll go over this really quickly. Uh, we've also just adopted a value statement. And um, so if you'll notice that top value is community and it's about how we work together. And our value statement is, is not only where we, you know, the mission and vision are where we want to go, um, but this is how we want to be. And this is really central. These values are really central. We, we've taken them, we did listening to um, all of our board, which includes Wabanaki leaders, as well as um, non-Native folks. But we found some things that were through lines that are shared values. And that's part of what we are working on too, is to center ourselves in Native values, but these are human values too. So the idea of community and that we celebrate our diversity, but it's our interrelatedness that we're also focused on and our interrelatedness. So our community can be more than just people to um, respect. We are a truth telling muse museum, but we also really want to be in dialogue and listening. Responsibility, um, we're, you know, we honor our resources and um, this, so this also includes the land, right? This includes our collections. This includes the land that we're on um, and that we have obligations to Wabanaki people. And then the last one is around creativity. Um, you know, some of this, um, I think there are other movements too that are really focusing on joy as a place and futures um, that we can, we can, it's really important to truth tell. It's really important to talk about our histories and what's happened, but we also want to own our joy and our creativity and our ability to collaborate fully, not only amongst Wabanaki and other native people, but across the board. Um, and um, with all of our audience members, our partners, is there a, a really exciting moment? Next slide, please. So this gets on to some of the activities that we're doing. So um, we are we have. She mentioned that there's going to be the Dawnland Festival and Arts and Ideas. Uh, the the baseline idea uh, that grows out from this new work, this new thoughts that we're having about our mission and what we want to do, um, and that gets back to that value I talked about in the beginning, is that Native arts and cultures cannot be separated from Native ways of knowing. So I have heard people at times say to me, I love Navajo culture. They make beautiful blankets. And it's true. They make beautiful blankets. Uh, and a lot of culture is embedded in those blankets. And I would say the same thing about, you know, in the kind of museum field we might call material culture, um, but it's really art and expressive culture of the people. Um, but embedded in that are, what we ask ourselves is, um, you know, much of that art is guided by native values, guided by, by traditional knowledge, um, so the, the care for the land, the biodiversity that the majority of the majority of biodiversity in this, on the planet is, is cared for by indigenous people. Um, all of that is behind a basket or as you see a canoe here or any of these items that are made by Wabanaki people. 
um, are contain so much. They contain the gathering practices. They contain the caring for the forests, for the ash trees. Um, they contain the knowledge from generation. They contain language. Um, they contain intergenerational learning. Um, so, so I just, that is a really important concept. And so if you go to the next slide, um, we had done some markets before. We have a history of uh, doing amazing, both the Native American Festival with the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance and with um, uh, AMIM, which is our Abbey Museum Indian Market, which got disrupted during the pandemic. We came back last year. But I had always had a vision in starting this position to evolve this and to really go back to that idea of Native ways of knowing cannot be separated from Native arts and culture. And to have a festival that not only includes an amazing market and performances, um, which I hope you'll all join us out, but several panels that are really talking about the big questions of our time. Because our hope is to, like what we said about folks really not understanding, uh, um, there being a lack of information out there, um, there is more. I don't want to say that there's none. Um, but to really understand about the things that are affecting us all, how indigenous people from this place and, you know, in this, on Turtle Island, really think about these things, we feel that there is a hunger for. Um, so there are going to be um, four different panels with some really illustrious speakers. And, you know, you can look on our website. We both have Wabanaki leaders, as well as some uh, leaders throughout, throughout the country. We have um, that are coming, but our four panels, one is on um, the environment. Uh, another one is on um, sovereignty and, our, and the future of our democracy. Another one is on uh, food sovereignty and food ways. And the last one is on the role arts plays in transforming our futures. Art as a place for us to imagine and enact uh, the, the world we want to live in. Um, so I, I'm just, you know, thrilled. We've gotten some great support um, and would love to have you there um, to be part of the conversation. Next slide. The other way that we're thinking about um, and have tried out is to really, along with our, um, with our, um, the school tours, the adult learner tours that we do of the museum and the programs that we offer, our public programs. What we felt was needed was also um, some learning and activation guides that can be shared online. You don't have to be at the museum to have that we hope people will use not only just in conjunction with our, but with our programs, but will take away and maybe use in their communities, their faith groups, uh, their their uh, book club, so on and so forth, uh, as a place to start their own dialogue and do their own research. So the first um, guide that we produced, this is our first and only our pilot one, we released last Indigenous Peoples Day, um, and it's called We Can Thrive Together, an Allies Guide to Sovereignty. And we commissioned Jennifer Pictou, who's a, an amazing um, Mi'kmaq Mic -Mac artist and storyteller um, to create this poster. And on the back of the poster is um, uh, both some kind of facts and figures about sovereignty in Maine and beyond what it is. A lot of people are not aware of what sovereignty is um, and ways that you can be an ally. Uh, this is not a partisan uh, publication. It's really more like learning and resources. Um, and we really believe also, this is part of the joy and the creativity that we're weaving in here and to our basket that we're making uh, today is that people are reached by things beyond just facts and figures. So this inspirational piece of art that has this kind of double curve uh, with an ash sprout growing out of it um, with um, two women, that, that's actually um, Ambassador Molly and Bryant, um, Molly and Dana Bryant, uh, doing a rabbit dance with her daughter. Um, but this idea that we can all thrive together, 
um, that this is this is towards the betterment of us all. So there's not only a poster, there's a sticker, there's coloring pages, and there's links to uh, learn more. Next up, I'm hoping to do um, kind of an allies or learning discussion guide on weaving a sustainable environment. Next slide. So in, you know, my, I'm going to kind of finish up today uh, with some of the things that you can do both as an ally. So first as an ally and then for the Abbey Museum. Um, thinking about, because I wouldn't, I'm talking about, you know, both education and activation. I would be <laughs> amiss to leave that off, right? Always engaging, engaging and being in dialogue and then us being able to support each other. So next slide, please. So around all allyship, just some really good guidelines. Many of you may be already aware of this, but I always just do like to point it out, is that to listen and respect uh, Wabanaki people and other Native people first seek understanding of particularly of their values and ways of knowing, um, make Wabanaki peoples visible. And you notice I use the term peoples because there are, you know, five different tribal communities, four different nations, five different tribal communities, you know, acknowledge the lands, support news coverage, amplify, use your social media to um, support those, take the time, understand sovereignty, learn about it. Um, you know, there's, uh, when I came to Maine, I'm hearing constantly, oh, it's complicated, it's complicated. It actually is not that complicated. Um, <laughs> And there are plenty of really good resources out there to just learn the basics of what it means to be in a government gov to government relationship with the United States and to be seen as a as a um, a sovereign nation. Um, turn over the mic. So resist speaking for Native organizations and people, and make sure to invite them up to speak for themselves. Um, support. Use your dollars and your time, talent, um, and to support Wabanaki and other native run organizations. We love to smash stereotypes. Um, so, you know, if you have your voice, your platforms to make sure that accurate media and pop culture representations are out there. And then if you see something inaccurate as, as you're on your learning journey, demand accurate information in the reporting that you're getting and the curriculum and the books. Um, to make sure that the we're coming up on the you know 250th anniversary of the United States, and for us to move together in a way that's both thriving for our people our, and our and our planet, um, we need to we need to be in a place where we are truth telling and we are hopeful for the future, um, but that we are aligned um, and nobody is being squashed. So next slide. And then finally, um, for the Abbey itself, I would love to invite you all to plan a visit to the Abbey Museum. We're open Monday through Friday, um, May, end of May through the end, uh, to, through, we, through the end of October. Um, some people are like, why are you not open on the weekends? Um, we were closed during COVID. We had learned a lot of people are on um, turnover days. We're also building our capacity. Um, so, but we would love to have you join us. We'd love to have you join us at the Dawnland Festival of Arts and Ideas, July 12th and 14th. It is free and open to the public. Um, there are so many things to do. You can sit in the panel, you can shop. Um, you can meet the artists, you can go to performances. Um, we're really expecting it to be a wonderful time. Um, we'd also love to invite you to become a member of the Abbey Museum. Um, it's a really meaningful thing to do to us, uh, to join us. We are always looking for volunteers, particularly for the Dawnland Festival. I know there's gonna be a social media announcement, but if any of you are interested, you can reach out to me and let me know. And then the last thing is, you know, a very easy thing to do is download our Allies Guide to Sovereignty um, to make sure that you have that tool um, at your disposal. And so that's it. I just, you know, want to thank you in my language, Wado, which means thank you. 
Um, and I'm open to any questions that you have. Thank you so much. My goodness, there's so much um, good work happening at the Abbey Museum and, and across Maine and, and beyond. And we're just so grateful for, for that look behind the curtain and also that reminder and, and really good advice about what, what we can all do to be partners and allies with the Wabanaki people in Maine and, and with Indigenous people around, around the country and the world. So thank you so much. I, I can't resist starting with, with a question about that strategic planning process. MCV and MCA just went through a strategic planning process as well. I know there are such rich conversations that happen through that work. And I'm just so impressed with that new mission statement and vision statement and the values. And in the spirit of picking, peeking behind the curtain, I'm curious, what were some of the debates that happened? How did you, how did you get to that language together? Or, or was it easy and self-evident from the very beginning? Well, you know, that's a great question. I think it was, it was all of the above. There were things that we were debated. Um, you know, people have different ideas of museums. What you know, we have been swinging back. Like, are we solely dedicated to serving Wabanaki people? Are we, um, are we, a museum that it, are we just centered on our collections, right, and educating the general public? Who are our audiences? We really had to ask ourselves those questions. What, and if we are centered on Wabanaki people, what can we do as a museum do, right? Like, um, do we need to change the nature of what we do? What we came up with in all those conversations and all the listening was that people really valued it as a museum. They really valued it as a place of Wabanaki um, support and liberation. Um, and, and we really had to look at what was the most if what was the most strategic things that we could do and really we are a public education platform um and so not to take away from our collections our exhibits because those are central central to the visitor experience center central to the power of our educational um things but what we, we decided is that we also needed to really get focused on what we want to educate people about and activating people. So that took a little back and forth, but I think everybody came to one mind and we do try to practice consensus decision-making on our board and council. Um, so, so we weren't going to move forward unless we were of of at least one mind about the general idea. And in the values, we first listened to um, language keepers. We brought in um, language keepers from each one of the nations to really talk about their values and how they were informed by their language because there's so much embedded um, in those languages. And then from there, we went on to listen to um, our council and council members, and then it came back to the staff, and then it came back to everybody. And so it was it was this flowing process. Thank you. I know that that sort of detail isn't isn't always the the kind of thing that you share with with the public, but my goodness, it's it's so interesting and heartening to hear the sort of practicing practicing those values as you articulate them and, and the richness of those conversations. Uh, I, I also really appreciated the, the way that, that you talked about some of the, the things that people will see in the museum and, and such an interesting entry point. And, and we have lots of participants on, on the call today who, who shared, you know, really rich memories of, of the birch bark shelter and of basket making classes. And, and that's clearly a really powerful entry point 
Will you say a little bit more about how you think about those things like like a basket making class of like, what does that mean for, for the Abbey Museum to, to invite folks in and then also to, to help us go further than, than that thing? Absolutely. Um, so I don't think we're doing away with anything. The only thing actually that we did have that was really popular and really wonderful on a basis of the Abbey Museum that we have made a shift on, and this was before my time, was around archaeology. There used to be field schools. There used to be a lot around archaeology. And at some point, a decision was made that the real archaeology needed to happen by um, the TIPOs, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, that they needed to be the main folks doing Wabanaki archaeology. We're we educate in our exhibits. Um, in the When I first came in, I was like, so are we teaching folks Wabanaki basketry that aren't Wabanaki? And what we what we do do is actually have basket makers, and we don't have one scheduled for the summer, but we'll have other things coming up like it, where a basket maker would share just like basic um, basket weaving technique, but not their personal traditional knowledge passed down, right? Um, around around things that are are truly traditional to them. Um, but the canoes are incredible teaching tools. Um, and they actually talking about kind of this more holistic worldview, um, you know, and I used that, that Navajo example earlier, like I love Navajo culture. They make beautiful blankets. Well, part of the Navajo worldview is a, is a notion called Pajo, which both means beauty and balance. Um, they talk about the beauty way or walking in beauty. Um, and this is very much like of, of being in balance with the world. And that's another thing that you can see very much uh, embedded in the, ex, you know, this incredible canoes. These are used for being on the water for their lives, but are, in, but are just imbued with such incredible beauty and such incredible um, depth. I don't know who else to put that. Uh, that that those values are just infused into all of that work. So that will continue. That will certainly continue. And what we hope to do is to also just figure out ways to channel people to make the connection and to learn what to do next. So that's like the Dawnland Festival is is not just the the meeting the artists, you know, kind of learning about their practice, but but talking about the things behind that cultural practice and then maybe directing people to learn more. I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of us at the Dawnland Festival because we've got a lot of, of enthusiasm for that. And so clearly there are things that that being together in community will will be a huge part of that that festival. But now that we're all so used to Zoom things too, will any of those panel discussions be recorded or or is, what do you think will be? And in fact, we are looking at in the future, uh, kind of a sustainability and partnership model where maybe we can live stream it or something like that. But we're just looking at that right now, but we will record them for kind of archival and promotional purposes and educational purposes. That's great news. We all know summer in Maine gets a little bit nutty, so we don't always get to do the things we want to do in real time. Uh, we do have some folks, though, who are eager to to do more than just attend. Are you looking for volunteers? Are there ways to Absolutely. support the festival? Um, and I'm happy to, you can have folks write me or, you know, that's fine. I can pass them along to our volunteer coordinator for the festival. If anyone, anyone wants to volunteer, we'll, we would love that. Thank you. And and Betsy, that's a good reminder that I was so excited to get into to this conversation and, and questions that I skipped right over the part of the program where I remind everybody that you'll get not only a recording of this conversation, but an email with a bunch of great follow-up materials, including information about the Dawnland Festival contact information if you want to volunteer, and that ally guide. What an incredible resource. Could could you tell us a little bit more about 
how we as, as environmentalists mm -hmm. can be better and more active allies. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we haven't created that guide yet, but um, I really think it, it really follows those principles that I, I shared. Um, is that it about how to generally be an ally? Um, you know, within the environment, I think sometimes, and this gets down to interrelatedness, right? Is that, um, you know, there is an environmental movement and, and in Maine, there has been an environmental movement for a long time. I think there's a lot of folks that really, really care about the land and waters and um, the, the animals, the plants, it all in Maine, because it is a precious, precious resource. Um, and I think that there have been moments there that Wabanaki people have at the, been at the forefront of this, but to really, you know, kind of look what's been happening at the, um, at the global level of indigenous people of, of really listening to and giving space for leadership of indigenous people within these spaces. I know the, um, the National Park Service, uh, the Interior Department is really calling for co-stewardship as the, as the kind of law of the land going forward um, in thinking of ways that, um, that really share the thought leadership. You know, and, and once again, I'll say we're having a conversation with it with Sherry Mitchell, Honor Keeler, um, who's a professor at Brown University, um, and Suzanne Greenlaw, um, Sherry is an attorney and an advocate. If you don't know her, she's Penobscot and an author. Um, and Suzanne Greenlaw is Maliseed and an environmental scientist and is doing some incredible work with Acadia National Park. Um, to really listen to them and inquire what is helpful. Um, because having these things on two different tracks are really not um, as helpful. I, I was just in a conversation with the folks on our our food, our native food panel, the chefs themselves were like, you know, this is really a story about the environment. What we, if, if you're really thinking about native foods, we're talking about native grown foods that are related to the health of our water and to the health of our soil and to the health of our animals and our fish. All these relatives of ours aren't as healthy as they could be. And what goes into our body comes from the earth, comes from our mother, the earth. And this is our message to you. So, so we're going to be talking about the environment quite a bit, and I think those worldviews are really important to, um, to remember, but also to center Wabanaki people in those conversations. Such a, it's such an important reminder of of how much, uh, how much colonization has harmed all the way the that. that all of us think about the world, right? We have we have yeah. harmed indigenous communities first and foremost, but but also just undercut that knowledge and and rich history and way of thinking about the world that that is um, far more far more integrated and holistic and and yeah, we have a, a lot of asset there. Yes, yes. I, I'm curious about. Um, whether that what the Abbey Museums, like what you're thinking about in terms of outreach to, to schools and other community groups, you mentioned that Maine at, at least has has laws on the books about uh, educating students about Wabanaki history. We don't always live up to those. Um, but how can we help connect kids and teachers and the next generation with with the richness of this history and, and current thinking? Well, that's, that's a great question because, um, you know, I don't wanna take away from the efforts that are happening with the Moose modules and all the curriculum development that's happening. Um, uh, and there are amazing resources um, and we hope to be complementary to that. I have to say we're a pretty small museum. And so I only, I have an education department of one so we offer in-person tours, but we're re and we also do um, um, digital tours to digital programs 
Um, and we're really thinking about expanding more digitally because we're in Bar Harbor and Maine is a huge state. And it's a lot to have an under-resourced school to be able to come to Bar Harbor. Um, so we're really doing some thinking of ways that the content be, can be shared um, in ways that are really helpful that, you know, kind of think about the equity of, of folks reaching us. So we're really interested in that. And that also goes for adult learners too. Yeah, and and through another, you know, another kind of collaboration I'll I'll ask about is how you know are the are you in partnership or in conversation with with other tribal museums in, in other places? Or how does that I'm just curious about that network? Well, one of our plans, so we do have um um we have on our board part of the Wabanaki majority of our board includes uh, tribal leaders and folks that are from so Donald Soctoma um, and the Doc Magook, their their tribal um, museum leader is on our is on our tribal council. The cultural and historic preservation officers on our council and board. So we have relationships with those folks. But part of the strategic plan is to also uh, create more of a streamlined relationship um, to have a convening and gathering with those tribal museum and historic and preservation officers, because not all of the um, nations have tribal museums in Maine. This is part of the under-resourced nature of that, the barriers that um, this legislation has stood in the way of, um, of some of the resources flowing their way from the federal government towards building their own tribal museums. A win-win for us is a stronger um, you know, this is a lift all boats model, a stronger tribal museum, stronger tribes with stronger tribal museums is a stronger abbey um, and is a stronger main, you know, we want them empowered. Yes, 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 yes. And, um, and I really appreciate you putting that in you know, the work of the abbey in context with the, that, that effort for, um, for tribal self determination and and I'm curious we're we're making the increment the small and incremental and not sufficient but progress that we can make each day and and curious about how how you think it might look different um we're going to we're going to get there and and what will be different when the the sovereign the inherent sovereignty of the Wabanaki nations is finally recognized by the state of of Maine, as it is by so many of the people in Maine. Of course, of course. Um, yes, when that legislative uh, goal happens, I mean, as you can see, well, that's why I shared that chart. Um, there are so many things that Maine has the right to block that are available to nation to tribal nations across the United States. And um, without those barriers in place, even though I, I don't believe that Maine is ill-intended, but the, um, as you could see by that chart, like I, I really do think that there will be more tribal businesses, um, more tribal involvement in workforce housing and, um, and farming and fisheries. I mean, there already are these things, but I think there will be much more um, uh, vibrant and, uh, and successful, which, you know, I really think uh, it, in, including cultural tourism, including, um, I mean, tribes have all different kinds of businesses that they can do. I think, you know, most people are like, oh, they're just going to open a casino or something like that. And I think it's really important to look at some of the stories from across the United States. There's a project at um, Harvard called Harvard Honoring Nations that is really about honoring um, what tribal governments are doing across the United States. That's what this study came out, that chart that I showed you. Um, and, and it's really quite remarkable um, of, of everything from the pharmaceutical networks to the farming, to the, um, the cultural tourism, to the um, restaurants, to food, to um, environmental networks, to all different kinds of things that strong tribal nations add to our our nation itself. I'm 
going to ask you about one of the phrases you used there, cultural tourism. My my first thought is my hackles come up and I think, is that a good thing? But, but it sounds like it is. So tell me what's the difference between, you know, tell me what good cultural tourism looks like. Um, Well, the first, you know, I think, you know, tourism can, can really be destructive. Absolutely. I mean, we know that over tourist in places (laughs) uh, suffer, Um, but it's a nothing about us. It goes back to the nothing about us without us, right? And the self-determination goals is that I know uh, Penobscots are really uh, doing a really, really great job. Um, They are, they have other tribes are doing some in Maine are doing some um, cultural tourism work, but it really means that um, that tribes are accepting or having programs where they are either, well, I'll use the Penobscot as an example, taking people on um, canoe journeys to Sugar Island on the Penobscot River, um, then to do some um, cultural education. So it isn't like we're going to, we're going to, dance in front of you and entertain you this is what i mean by um the kind of the mindset so i want to get back to the values and the mindset the mindset of extractive nature and this gets down to how we think about the environment too is this all here for us for us to take are we here to be in relationship and so the idea of of native cultural tourism is for people to learn um and to support and, and to have an experience, but not just to be entertained and extract. That makes so much sense. It makes all the difference in the world. And and Betsy, I just want to thank you for, for being in relationship with us for this last hour. And, and going forward, I am I'm so um, honored to, to get to talk with you today, to have this conversation with our our community and cannot wait to see you at the Dawnland Festival. Uh, thank you to everyone who who joined today. Thank you for your your really good questions. I'm sorry we did not get to all of them. And uh, I guess that means we'll just have to keep being in conversation, which uh, which I think is exactly what we need. So thank you all. You will get a follow up email with a whole bunch of resources. Hope to see you all in Bar Harbor. Uh, That is the weekend of July 11th, July 12th. Is that right? It's the Friday evening, July 12th. and goes through Sunday, July 14th. Perfect. We will see you then. I hope we will also see all of you here next week for our uh, a a different kind of lunch and learn. We will be welcoming... uh, MIT professor, Dr. Larry Suskind, who's going to talk us through how we can transform these conflicts around renewable energy projects. Another relevant topic here in the state of Maine. So thank you all. Hope to see you soon and uh, all the best. Thank you.